We have um, three presenters. The first is Lionel Cliff, whose co-author presenter, Morris Sheftel, is unable to be here today. Cliff is, along with Sheftel, is, is a member of the Postage Department at the University of Leeds, and will be presenting on 150 years of Yorkshire cricket and its changing social context, followed by my colleague, from the University of Texas Sociology, Ben Carrington, who will be presenting Cricket as Black Cultural Politics in the Age of the Post-Colonial. And finally, we will have Madeline Hunt Ehrlich, who will introduce and then screen her film, A Gentleman's War. All right, and so first we'll have uh, Lionel. To begin on a personal note, uh, Apologies from my co-author, Morris Sheftel, who's been in and out of hospital. Glad to say he's out, but he's still not up to a public event like this. On a personal note, not only am I in this fortunate position of sharing uh, an L initial and Lionel with our, uh, what shall I say, our mentor, but I did have the good fortune to meet C.L.R. James, uh, I think around 1970. Several years after his visit to Ghana, which we heard about, he came to Tanzania. And I remember asking him, you know, why, why was he there, you know? Uh, and he said, I'm here, and this is a, a black people that's English speaking, that's committed to socialism, as it then was, how could I not come? <laughs> and uh, he, he was there for about a month, and he gave three public lectures at the university. The whole series was billed three great revolutionaries. The first one was on Jesus Christ, the next on Karl Marx, and the one on Lenin. And I was, happened to be in Tanzania last month, talking to a generation that was kind of radicalized by people like him visiting their country almost 50 years ago, and who could still remember the kind of thrill of listening to CLR. Now these same people are retired professors and, uh, and the like. But anyway, that's a, a personal thing. What we are offering is a very preliminary look at some research challenged by the fact of this conference into thinking about uh, Yorkshire County Cricket, which is celebrating its 150th year, and the coincidence of that with the 50th year of publication. And what insights does Beyond the Boundary give to an understanding of that long period, and especially about the contemporary situation in Yorkshire. I'll say a little bit, and only a very little bit, about the first hundred years. Too much of a distraction. And what we will concentrate on, especially in a short presentation, are, are two issues, two facts that need explaining. One is that in all those 150 years, it took until the year 2001 for any player of Caribbean origin to play for Yorkshire, with the exception of Richie Richardson, who was signed for one year as the official overseas uh, player when Richie Richardson was captain of West Indies. But otherwise, of, as it were, local Caribbean people, one guy with the illustrious name of Weeks played two matches. 
that's it. Equally sort of awesome and, and despairing is the fact that it wasn't until 2004 that the first Yorkshire player of Asian origin played for the county. And the record, I think, of Yorkshire is somewhat worse than most of the other counties in bringing on professional cricketers from minority peoples. Uh, and that needs explaining. Why so few? Why so did it take so long? But that was an issue that did begin to be raised in the 1990s, maybe even earlier. What I think is another sort of fact of life, much more recently, is, is, is really, for me, embodied in, in two very recent episodes. If you watched, even on television, any cricket last summer in, in Britain, just about uh, this time, the Yorkshire captain was injured. The 2020 period uh, began in June. And so the temporary captain, who skipped the team to the ultimate finals, was a 21-year-old Pakistani-born lad from Barnsley. And he has the authentic accent to show he's from Barnsley. And he won all the matches except for the one that was reigned off during his reign as captain. And he was ably assisted by Adil Rashid, Bradford-born lad who's actually played for England, and uh, an up-and-coming fast bowler called Moeen Afshar. And then this year, in celebration of this 150th anniversary, amongst all kinds of events, there was... Just last week, a special video launch, you can download it from the web, about the whole of this 150 years of history, of course, starting with one of the key characters, Lord Hawke, who not only was in, uh, Yorkshire captain for 27 years and president for 30 years, some of that period overlapping, but brought, he claims, cricket to India. But the voiceover in this video, the commentary, is by this same 21-year-old Moeen Afshar. And it's quite symbolic that he is seen by the Yorkshire County as the voice of the future, not just, of course, of the past. How has that come about? Really quite a, a sudden change. So two kinds of issues. Now... The bit I want to say about the more distant past is that I think to explain why there was this exclusion for so long after the Second World War and the immigration began, you can only understand it in relation to a long uh, tradition of Yorkshireness, which in involved all kinds of things. And rather than go into a full explanation, I think the I just note very, a quick list of things which CLR and other accounts of the 19th century and early 20th century are useful in some cases to refer back to, but also questionable, in, at least in so far as they apply to Yorkshire. First, CLR is very interesting in that he calls the early 1860s 150 years ago, as a period of rush to institutionalize sporting associations in all fields, and refers to the fact that the football associations created almost the same year as, as, as Yorkshire County. Most importantly for cricket is, uh, is that the rule allowing overarm bowling is introduced at the same moment and of course, you know, as CLR would note, that changes the whole technique on which the game is based. So the moment, if I can use that word, uh, of the creation of Yorkshire County is uh, at a key time when a number of other things happening to, to do with sport.
but it's also set in the particular social economic context of of Yorkshire and Yorkshire cricket. And here I think CLR has to be challenged. The the idea of village cricket, of even of the aristocracy, or at least the squirearchy, playing with their labourers and tenant farmers, uh, might apply to some parts of England, but not to much of the north of England. Cricket, even in the mid-19th century, is a game played in, of course, odd villages and, and rural estates, but in mill towns and pit villages and in big cities. And it's primarily played by working class uh, players. CLR characterizes the 1890s and early 1900s as the golden age of English cricket. And, if he, and as he personalizes this, he, he lists uh, Grace, of course, his hero, uh, one of his heroes. Uh, C.B. Fry, who we heard mentioned uh, this morning, Jessup, uh, Ranjit Sinji, uh, the classic stylists and gentlemen of the aristocracy. But you go to Yorkshire and the two key periods, two key players alongside Lord Hawke, who was simply captain and not really a player. <laughs> he, he was captain because of his class, not because of his ability. A little bit like West Indian cricket in the <laughs> early 20th century. But the two key players were George Hurst, who still scored the biggest total ever scored for Yorkshire, and Wilford Rhodes, who has scored, more, who took more wickets than any other bowler in cricket history, and these were working-class lads from near Huddersfield, and they played both of them for thirty years. In Rhodes' case, their defining influence on the tactics and also the tradition of playing not to lose, of uh, being in control of a technique that is all caution and very skillful. And in some ways, even CLR gets, I think, a little bit. He doesn't correct Cardus enough in talking about Constantine in Lancashire cricket. And one or two other authors, uh, like Marcuse, have shown how Constantine becomes the ultimate league professional in sharing some of these same values. The other crucial cultural tradition of Yorkshire cricket in that long early period was the uh, self-belief that, as one eminent current writer says, nowhere else was so absorbed in cricket or regarded it so earnestly, nowhere else studied it so thoughtfully or followed it with such obsessive passion and certainly nowhere else were the vagaries of the game so cherished, so understood, or so utterly and deeply felt than in Yorkshire. And led, among other things, to a proud sense of self. But that proud sense of self was ultimately the cultural basis for a belief that you had to be Yorkshire-born to play for Yorkshire. An unwritten rule that applied until early 1990s except if you were a gentleman. And there are plenty of his historical <laughs> exceptions among the aristocracy for whom this didn't fit. And of course, that is given as one of the explanations of why it was so difficult for people from over, immigrants from overseas to break into the game. The problem is that by the time that rule was changed in the 1990s, there were already at least one, if not two, generations of Caribbean and Asian people born in Yorkshire who still weren't <laughs> getting the opportunities. And it's interesting, some, in, some work in the early 1990s by Marcusa, by a great uh, writer, Sivanandan, from the Institute of Race Relations and Race and Class, began to talk 20 years ago about institutional racism. And again, you've got to unpick that term, but for, for us, in looking at 
Yorkshire's uh, performance, the institutional barriers to inclusion began with uh, clubs, long traditions, long belief in self, long belief in the local culture, and lots of fixtures. So that even when Caribbean and then Asian people formed their own clubs because the individuals couldn't get games, there was no room on the calendar for odd fixtures, or no grounds for them to, to play. So what began to develop were, first of all, games amongst these uh, Asian and Caribbean clubs, often involving quite long distances. And then the formation of leagues between Asian clubs. And the most significant of these, I think, and is actually listed every year in Wisden, is one called Kaide Azam, which is also the name of the premier championship in Pakistan, and was also the honorific given to Mohammed Jinnah, the, the founder of, of Pakistan. And that league, which began in Bradford and Dewsbury, Huddersfield area in the 1980s, now has 27 teams playing in two leagues every year. And perhaps even more significant is that a new entrant uh, this year into that league, uh, which, which was called Bradford uh, Kashmir Club, had been accepted in a local league uh, and been playing, if you like, integrated career for a number of years, but applied to switch to the Pakistani league because they wanted to improve the quality of their cricket, which would be possible, they thought, in, in, the, in Yorkshire's Pakistani league. But that is just one dimension of, of the response to the exclusion that had existed. And in one really uh, locally famous remark that is often quoted back at Yorkshire County Cricket Club, the then rather ferocious secretary who sat four England captains from Yorkshire in his time actually made a statement saying, well, let them go and play in their own leagues when he was asked uh, in the late 70s, early 80s about the future of uh, Asian players, particularly in Yorkshire cricket. Things have changed since then, and given my uh, shortage of time, let me just list some of what has happened, especially at local level, that you're getting long-established traditional teams now not only including Asian players or even poaching them from the Pakistani and other leagues, but more and more clubs are, are hiring semi-pros on, I don't know, 100, 150 quid a match, sometimes on a, a year-long contract. And this is giving an opportunity, especially to young Asian players, but though not exclusively. Even the Sheffield Caribbean Club, which has had a long existence and you know, is, is very similar to what you'll be hearing about from Ben Carrington in a, in, a, in a moment, the Leeds equivalent. They now run three teams, uh, one in uh, an important uh, South Yorkshire league, uh, one in a midweek league, and then they also have a Sunday league, which is uh, where the Caribbean side is half Asian. So you're getting semi-pros as well as ordinary players. You're getting schools and under 15-year teams of established clubs hiring in semi-pros as coaches, who are often these young Asian lads who are showing a great deal of promise. There is another example of what is happening, especially from the ground upwards in Bradford in December. The Adil Rashid Cricket Academy in was started, which is... Uh, in a way, it's private business. But it shows that Rashid, who's played, as I say, for the one-day English international, and is still only 25, amongst young Asian men, 
is already an established role model. And of course, this is part of the significance of this change. It's not only that Asian players are playing for, for Yorkshire, playing at all levels and running their own activities at, at a local level. It's the fact that in a much broader sense, who do they know of cricket, only cricket, no, are the role models. And one element in this story that has made possible these changes is the subsidizing of a great deal of local level community cricket. Not so much through count the Yorkshire County Club, which is what I had originally thought, but through the English Cricket Board and its local subsidiary, the Yorkshire Cricket Board, which is given the responsibility for promoting community cricket and provides an enormous range of coaching at levels from under 12 upwards. And in conversation I had just in the last few days with one of the, the directors of this whole program, he quoted the fact that all of the young people going through were only 2% Asian 10 years ago. They're now something like 13% of a much, much larger uh, stream of people. And one last sentence. When I asked him why this new initiative, which, as I say, even has the effect of having Yorkshire professionals, where did it come from? He said, it all goes back to the Bradford riots in 2011. So if one wants to know what beyond cricket <laughs> needs to be understood to explain what happens in cricket, here is a very, very crucial indicator in places like Yorkshire, especially West Yorkshire, the riots the threat in all kinds of ways from Islam and terrorism. And cricket as somehow providing part of the answer, that's part of what has to be studied uh, to understand the, uh, the two questions we pose. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers, Chris and Andy and, and others for putting on this event. I think my, my talk nicely uh, dovetails with, with Lionel's and perhaps provides, um, I just want to say some colour, I'm trying to think of a better metaphor, um, some, some ethnographic detail in relation to the, kind of the, the broad strokes that, uh, that, that Lionel just outlined. And I want to reflect upon an ethnographic study that spans, has now spanned 18 years, three decades and two centuries. Just, this is my pitch to the publisher, you can already see my, you know, my attempt to convince them is that this will sell more than 500 copies. And given that I've only got 20 minutes, uh, I'm not going to do justice to the amount of data, stories, interviews that have taken place o over that, that time period. So instead, I'm going to do a kind of a synoptic overview of the, of the project, which is an ongoing project, and to think about some of the uh, ways in which the continu continuing relevance of, of Beyond the Boundary, uh, in particular, in the age of the post-colonial, uh, remains important, especially in a period that's marked by continuing forms of neo-colonial re relations, even after the formal dismantling of colonial forms of governance. And in many ways, I think this kind of reflects, uh, in relation to the point that Robert Hill pointed out earlier th this morning about the ways in which uh, kind of James's analysis only makes sense in a different way once it's located in England. So actually, the, the fact that this study is located in England in trying to think about the Caribbean diaspora actually, I think, is essentially uh, important. So there we are, all tangled up together, the old barriers breaking down, and the new one's not yet established, and a time of transition, always and inescapably turbulent. In the inevitable integration into a national community, one of the most urgent needs, sport, in particular cricket, has played and will play a great role. There is no one in the West Indies who will not subscribe to the aphorism, what do they know of cricket, who only cricket know. So there are two ways in think about uh, revisiting beyond the boundary. First is in the obvious sense of revisiting, in the sense what this conference uh, itself is about to kind of reread the legacy, the importance, and I think it's also important to think about the limitations of, of James's text. Uh, uh, we've kind of skirted around some of the limitations, but I think actually, in order to do credit to, to James's project, we, we, we shouldn't turn our eyes around 
uh, away from some of those limitations. But the second sense in which I'm wanting to revisit the text and these issues of what I'm referring to as black cultural politics is in relation to a particular ethnographic study that I've done of a, of a black cricket team as a way to think about some of the continuities, um, that which remains routine and regular, as, as James himself might put it, and also the shifts within black British communities over the past two to three decades. So in the time remaining, I want to briefly sketch four key aspects which I think kind of structure beyond the boundary. And in the second half, I'm going to look at some of the findings from my project. So four key arguments structure beyond the boundary, I want to suggest. First, James uses self-reflection and autobiographical method as a vehicle through which to understand the importance of cricket and the impact of colonialism on Caribbean society. So long before forms of autoethnography and reflective qualitative research methods became de rigueur within the social sciences and humanities, I want to suggest that James was utilizing the self to critically explore the social fabric of life. Second, Beyond the Boundary employs an inter-multidisciplinary approach, engaging and drawing upon variously history, political science, literature, philosophy, and aesthetics. And this is the type of eclectic uh, approach to thinking about culture that later comes to be associated with, with the British Cultural Studies project. Uh, and I think is in many ways kind of prefigured by James, and I think that's maybe the parallel that uh, we were kind of asked to reflect upon this morning in relation to Stuart Hall. Third, James un unashamedly takes popular culture seriously. He suggests, as we saw in a film last night, that the passions produced by popular forms of entertainment and leisure, and sport in particular, make it an important site for critical analysis, and in fact, perhaps a more important site than the so-called high arts. Uh, I love that line in Beyond the Boundary when he's challenged by a professor of political science at an august institution, say, the University of Glasgow, as to why a man of his political and ethical values should have an interest in sports. And James's response is, I just had no wish to answer the guy. I mean, it's like, it's such a, if you can't see that, the amount of time it would take me to explain to you why this is important, I don't have the time for that. And so and many of us who have found ourselves in similar situations, I think, and sometimes take James to heart. Fuck off is another way to put it less <laughs> elegantly. And fourth, James centers questions of power. He refuses the concertive idealization of sport to somehow absolutely remove from wide society and politics, and by extension, that sport somehow is free from racism. So this is the, the, the fragile but necessary um, dialectic of sport as politics versus sports as aesthetic transcendence that runs throughout the text. So as numerous commentators have noted from Grant Fared to Andy Smith and others, James reads culture and by extension the game of cricket itself, not merely as a reflection of politics, but a site of conflict, struggle and contestation in which the players themselves come to assume heightened social significance. Cricket as a cultural form and practice is interesting precisely because it invokes very profound thoughts and feelings of Englishness, creating effective attachments to often quite nostalgic imaginings of what is seen to be typically English. The scenes, the sounds, the smells, the English countryside, the rolling green pastures, small villages, country spires, pubs, warm beers. And there's something I'm, I'm kind of thinking through in this project as well, um, is to think a bit more about the sounds of cricket, the sounds of sports. I actually, I was, think it was, this came to mind uh, during uh, Robert Hill's talk this morning when he was emphatically um, infused by mentioning the crack of, 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 of the bat and when Headley was, was batting. Um, and, you know, we, it's interesting the ways in which cricket is often reduced to the sound of leather and willow. There's, there's, a, there's a specificity and a, and a significance, I think, to thinking about sound, which is something I'm trying to kind of work through in this project, beyond the visual. So there's a ways in which we, we, we use the visuals as a kind of primary mode to understand cultural forms. But I think if we don't engage with, with the sense of sound, it's something that, uh, having lived in America for nine years, when I do come back to England, slash Scotland, slash Britain, I'm struck by familiar sounds of the sounds that cars make and streets and conversations and the radio and certain uh, intonations of voice. And I think that's something that we, we especially sociologists, have really struggled to kind of um, think through. And I'm influenced here by uh, particularly the work of uh, Les Back at Goldsmiths, who's, I think, been at the forefront of trying to think about the, the sound in particular. And I want to come back to the sound in, in a moment. Therefore, it's not surprising that for conservative philosophers and intellectuals like uh, Roger Scruton, in his um, uh, lament on the decline of England, that when they reach for signifiers of Englishness alongside the White Cliffs of Dover and, and tea, cricket performs a certain type of work. And yet, that very same game has been a vehicle for black Caribbean expression and nationhood and pride. So it's this kind of contradictory aspect to cricket in particular as a sport that I think is, is, is interesting that 
was also kind of animated many of us uh, in this room in terms of our work. It becomes a site, the very same cultural form that's the embodiment of Englishness becomes also the site for Caribbean uh, resistance and black pride, uh, reflected in the documentary Fire in Babylon quite well, I think. Now, this fairly familiar narrative poses, uh, I think, a number of questions for us, at least for, for myself, in terms of what do these themes, these issues mean in a moment of the post-colonial, not at the time when James was writing, and not even at the time when kind of Fire in Babylon kind of charts the kind of, I would say, mid-70s to early 90s moment of West Indian cricket supremacy. What happens to these forms of resistance when the West Indies is no longer supreme on the international arena? And if we are making these arguments about the impact and importance of cricket as a social institution in relation to people's daily lives, how do those daily lives shift and change, if at all? Which brings me to my project. So in the mid-1990s, I went to uh, Leeds uh, to do my uh, doctoral studies. And so in the summers of 1995, 96, 97, uh, I studied the Caribbean Cricket Club, which to my dating, I'm amongst historians now. I'm, I'm a sociologist on, uh, who really does cultural studies, so we, we don't really do scholarship. We, we make a lot of stuff up. Um, but one of the things I have made up uh, as a fact um, is that this is, to my mind, the, the oldest black cricket club in Britain. And I think the oldest sports club. So not just the oldest cricket club, but the oldest sports club that I've been able to find. It was originally uh, in 1947. Uh, there was a number of uh, Jamaican guys who had fought in the Second World War. They were demobbed and made the decision that rather than going back to the Caribbean, going back to Jamaica, they would stay in and they ended up in Leeds wasn't a whole lot to do for, for, for Jamaican guys in, in the mid-1940s in Leeds. And so they established a social club. In the following year, 1948, they established the Caribbean Cricket Club. And this was the club that I would then study in 1990s. The club is located in the area of Chapel Town, which is kind of perceived as, as a black area of Leeds. So much in the same way as Toxteff is read as the black area of Liverpool or Moss Side in relation to Manchester or St Paul's in relation to Bristol or uh, Brixton in relation to London, kind of Chapel Town. Is, is kind of imagined in, in, in a very similar way, with all the similar types of tropes around sexual deviancy, crime, uh, and so forth that often affects, that gets coded not just onto the area, but onto the in inhabitants of those spaces, regardless of their, their actual uh, actions. It's important to recognize that Chapel Town has actually often been a, a space of migration, so in the early 20th century, the ways of migration often were uh, from the Ukraine, from Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, and had a relatively large Jewish population as well. And so it's a post-Second World War migration in which the area gets coded as specifically um, um, black. And it's also important to recognize that the club was established, well, the social club was established in 1947, which predates the Windrush. Um, there's been some kind of good work in trying to problematize this notion of black people only arrive in Britain in 1948, you know, in, in uh, Tilbury Docks in June, and kind of disavows the early history actually of, who, of which James was a part in terms of, kind of certain types of, kind of pan-African, pan-Caribbean politics in which uh, London was an important location and other parts of, of the UK as well, Manchester, obviously, for the 1945 uh, Pan-African Congress. So the, I, one of the things I do then, I, I kind of read the cricket club as one of a number of relatively autonomous black cultural spaces that exist in, in the year of Chapel Town. So on the one hand, you have a large degree of disinvestment by the private sector, particularly during the 70s and, and the 80s. And then uh, you have a large number of fairly vibrant cultural associations, voluntary associations, and in a whole range of areas. And I, and I read, and I, I kind of argue that the, the Caribbean Cricket Club should be understood as one of these kind of collective, relatively autonomous black cultural spaces. From the interviews, it was, um, the, 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 the word survival came up often in the interviews with, with the club members and, and, and the players. They eventually, the, the club got, you can see that, that, that that's not taken from um, Trinidad or Barbados, that's actually a, Beckett's Park in Leeds, with the kind of ramshackle shack behind them, which served as the pavilion and, and the changing room, which is actually on the campus of Leeds Metropolitan University. So it's kind of interesting for me to be doing my PhD in the same location where the club sometimes would, would play. Uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, photos from the, I think from the size of the Afro, we're looking at probably about late 70s, this is a 77, 78. So there's a number of deep animosity within the club to various others. Um, Yorkshire County Cricket Club, the primary one. It was interesting that none of the guys, many of whom had spent decades in Leeds and Yorkshire, and some of whom, at least their, their, their sons were born in Leeds, supported Yorkshire County Cricket Club. The notion you would go down to support Yorkshire 
was anathema to them. They were seen to be the, the hostile enemy. Although a number of them still did support Leeds City Football Club, which is kind of interesting. So there's a kind of interesting dynamic there around kind of the, the place of football vis-a-vis -vis cricket within um, this space. Uh, so you could walk around with a Leeds City Football Club shirt, but none of the guys would walk around with a Yorkshire County Cricket Club um, jersey. There were tensions with the Leeds and the umpires. When they eventually got to a clubhouse in 1988, it was subject to two arson attacks and words were daubed up uh, on, on the side of the clubhouse with the words Nigger, niggers out. So there was a sense of embattlement about the club's fight for survival. And I read this um, fight for survival not just in cricketing terms, but a wider sense of the cultural and symbolic significance of, of, the, of the club um, to the local black population. The club also functioned as what one of them referred to as a home from home, as a Caribbean space enabling connections to be made to the Caribbean and producing a very kind of distinctive black Caribbean um, diasporic culture, both on and off the pitch. So uh, after many of the games, particularly the weekends, uh, the, 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 the changing room would be converted into, um, this is Daddy Rico, this is from 1997, uh, Daddy Rico, who DJed on the local pirate radio station, would convert the dressing room into his uh, DJ booth. You know, so in terms of the, the food, uh, rather than cucumber sandwiches, it was... Um, Curried uh, you know, chicken and, and salt fish and ackee would be served, etc., etc. And so there was a sense in which also, and going back to Knoll Lano's point, there were a number of players who would be the professional overseas players playing for various Yorkshire clubs that would then come to Caribbean. So, they, so their Saturday team who paid them would be the white team somewhere in Yorkshire, but they'd often come and play games for the Caribbean Cricket Club, especially friendly games. So I actually found myself in the mid 1990s playing alongside some, basically, you know, some of the Caribbean's best young cricketers who were just below the level of making it to the test level. So they weren't getting county contracts, but were able to kind of earn a sufficient um, summer salary by playing uh, uh, league cricket, which in Yorkshire is very strong. Yorkshire is one of the strongest um, counties for, for, for league cricket in, in Britain. So um, well, this is the first time that I met um, a guy who's referred to as the dentist, and not because he had a dental practice um, back, back home. His, his real name is John Maynard. Um, he's one of the fastest bowlers that came out of St Kitts Nevis. And that's our aspect to this, actually, that there's a strong connection between the Caribbean Cricket Club and St Kitts Nevis due to particular, kind of particular lines of migration. So, and at the time, um, John Maynard was widely regarded as one of the fastest bowlers in the Caribbean. Robin Smith, actually, one of you know, the South African-born England cricketer, who was widely regarded as one of the best English bowlers against fast-paced bowlers, at least never had a kind of, never wore... Um, he wore a helmet, but never with the, the face mask, and part, part it was a kind of Viv Richards notion of like taking on the quickies. Uh, he was asked uh, last summer, when he was being interviewed on, on Sky Sports, who was the fastest player he ever faced. And he said there was this guy from, from St. Kitts and Nevis called The Dentist. He was the fastest ever. And this was the guy. That, fortunately, I was playing alongside. Um, <laughs> <coughs> so um, so, so this, this is the kind of milieu into which I kind of found myself. So this is why the, the club functioned in this way. And, and the other point is in relation to and this was mentioned uh, this morning as well, this notion of sporting uh, antiphonia, kind of a call and response around black style that um, Richard Burton refers to. So the importance of the crowd as being a participant in the actual production and playing of the game. So uh, one of the distinctive aspects when uh, I would be playing was the constant commentary on my batting performance and suggestions as to which I should have paid, played. And the, kind of, and, the, and the ways in which when someone would get hit on the body, there'd be cries of, don't rub it, don't rub it, because you didn't want to show any sense of pain or intimidation towards the bowler. And also, when you would, when you would hit one of those glorious strokes and a, a great cover drive, shouts from the side to say, hold it, hold it. In other words, to hold the position. Just for an extra split second that was longer than necessary, <laughs> just to let the bowler know that you, know, you was in control and you was playing with a certain type of style and a certain type of panache. And there's often lots of discussions as well around the ways in which cricket was played differently in the Caribbean. This often was interesting for, the, for these young guys from the Caribbean who were very plain uh, at, at or just below first class level in the Caribbean, who often would struggle when they first came to England because of the way in which the ball would move around and the ways in which the ball comes onto the bat in a, in a, in a very different way, especially in, in Yorkshire in, in April and May under those conditions. And so they tend to know the players tend to be stronger off the back foot than it would be on the front foot in terms of driving. And as Clive, one of the players, once said to me when, when he was, I was asking him about you no know, driving, cover drives and stuff, and he says, no. And he told me once, he said, no, you, you know drive in the Caribbean. You want to drive, you get a car. So there's a sense in which you know, the, the players had to kind of adjust to the, the, the English context and weather. There's also a sense in which these events took on a, a deeper significance. This is Pete. He said to me, um, as far as we're concerned, we're, we're just an extension of the West Indies national team. So I say to him, rather naively, is it more than just a cricket game to you? He says, yes, it, it is. You see, I've heard the opposing teams talk, you see. I've been at a game when we've lost, and I've heard the words coming out of the dressing room, we've beaten the fucking black bastards, them, again. He thumps his steering wheel. So that takes the game away from being a game, it's a war then. And so this sense 
of the game's extra social significance of a predominantly black Caribbean team playing league cricket in the heart of Yorkshire against predominantly white teams, often from ex-mining villages, meant that every single game had a kind of charge to it. I'd, I'd kind of gone into the field hoping to see some of this maybe at a few points in the season, and actually every game had an underlying tension that got articulated in, in kind of in very interesting and, and subtle ways. The, the side wasn't exclusively black. There was a, there was a, a white player called um, Sean who played for us. You can see him there on, on the left. When I interviewed him, he said, there's this thing passed about the white man's past, which I don't take as an insult, partly because I think it was Brett or it might have been Richie or someone early on said, quote, when we're talking about the white man, we're not talking about you. We both burst out loud. They actually said that. He said, yeah. It was before, before I went to one of the first meetings we were going to, somebody addressed this. One of the senior guys said, when we're talking about the white man, and I was like, yeah. He says, we're not talking about you. And I understood what he was saying. And I said, okay. So there was an interesting way in which for certain white people that they could... And some, uh, Sean was interested in terms of his, his parents, his father was actually a missionary in South Asia. Um, he, he was a school teacher who chose to teach in Chapel Town. So there's an interesting kind of ways in which certain white people with an anti-racist sensibility could also be included within this particular um, space. So these were the main conclusions. I'm just going to quickly whiz through these and then get to the next bit somehow. So the key things here was the notion of sport being a symbolic marker of community identity. The sport was a site of racial masculine contestation. I think this is important as well. So it wasn't just that cricket was a site of kind of racial contestation, but how this was expressed was through very masculinist um, um, discourses. So there was a notion of kind of white masculinity versus black masculinity, but also a sense of competing black masculinities as to what kind of black man it meant to play cricket in, in a particular way. And this is going back to the mid-1990s. Few of the players actually wore um, helmets at this point, and there was a kind of a notion that uh, Viv Richards was... I think had just retired, but the kind of the iconic image of Viv Richard, I think, kind of haunted the club and many Caribbean guys. The notion that you would play just with a cloth cap and you take on the quicks. And so there was an incident where one of the players, Brett, got hit on the side of the head um, when we were playing against a team called Colton by a New Zealand player who was on the verge of the, of the New Zealand national team. So he was bowling probably about 90 miles an hour, maybe 91, 92. Quickest player I've, I've ever played against. And we've, you know, a couple of the players faced him without a helmet. And going back to the sounds of, that we invoked before about you know, the, the, the cracking sound of, of, of leather and willow, there's also another type of sound, which is a ball bowled at about 90 miles an hour that you miss and hits you on the side of the head. <laughs> that produces a crack. And it's a different type of crack. And I was actually one of the things I think that James doesn't engage in, I think it's deeply problematic, is a heroic celebration of certain types of, of hegemonic masculinity. So when, earlier when we were referring to Headley, you know, made 50 and then um, you know, 169 not out. The third one refers to him being laid out flat when he mistimed a ball. That means he's been smacked in the face by a bouncer that he's mistimed. The consequence of that actually are quite horrific for the individual. Um, and it means there's a, there's a kind of, the, 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 and I think there's a silencing actually of, of, of the damage that's actually done to some of these bodies down the line. So that's, that's something that I then unpack. So just very briefly, I'm going to run through these slides and I'll just conclude because I'm, I'm out of time. Um, so I went back to the club 14 years later. So 95, 96, 97, I did my, my study. In 2011, 2012, in this summer, I went back to the club to see what had changed, what hadn't. The club looks more or less the same as it did then. So this is the pavilion. The Leeds skyline had changed slightly, so there's a few more tall buildings um, dotted uh, around there. They eventually won the Leeds League, and the Leeds League then dismantled. There was a lack of clubs, which is another aspect of the kind of the cricket in, in, in England. They're now playing the Yorkshire um, um, Central League. A few, they've now got a, there's a clock above the clubhouse in the name, um, and a metal uh, tarpaulin there. Um, Daddy Rico still DJs, although he looks a bit grey now, as you can see. <laughs> Heated arguments still break out uh, on a regular basis. And the club still does kind of function as a black Caribbean cultural space. They organise every year a T20 soccer festival where mm -hmm. Huddersfield, Birmingham, Manchester, uh, Sheffield, Caribbean clubs come and play a, a, a T20 um, competition. These are some things that have changed, as, as I was mentioned. What's striking to me is that now most of the young guys playing are actually South Asian. They're not black Caribbean or black British players. Most of them actually are, are from Pakistan as well. And so there's been this really kind of interesting shift in terms of the kind of demographics of, of the younger players. Um, and especially for the, the youth team, the youth team is about 90% South Asian. So this has caused some tensions within the club. Many of the older guys lament the fact that the black British guys aren't playing cricket to the same degree. They lament the fact that because most of the young Asian guys are Muslim, they're not drinking Dragon Stout and Red Stripe, they're buying Cokes and Lucozaid. And that doesn't help the club financially. So there's a sense in which these guys only come to play cricket and they don't kind of you know, join in. So there's some tensions there. 
That said, I want to kind of suggest finally that there is a uh, more of a positive way to look at this. The club still serves curry chicken, but it's halal meat. So they can get in the meat from a local uh, Asian butcher so the, the young Asian guys can, can, uh, can, can eat it. Um, and some of the young Asian guys have learned to play dominoes and can smack the dominoes down onto the board as loudly as some of the older guys. So you have this interesting kind of mixture of young working class South Asian guys kind of learning from and, and actually literally in some cases being coached by some of the older black Caribbean guys. And I'll end on this image. It was my very last game for the club um, when I went back to revisit. Uh, it rained, of course. Um, but one of the things, of course, rain does when the sun does come out to produce these kind of beautiful rainbows. And there was this uh, picturesque moment on the last game as we were walking off as the long shadows were going across to Scott Hall Oval of this kind of rainbow that kind of arced over, over the club and, and the ground, which kind of gave me maybe a, a kind of a positive reading that the, the, the future of the Caribbean Club um, may well be bright. Okay, thank you very much. And now we have Madeline Hunt-Berlick. Good afternoon. Good Very afternoon. glad to be here, and I want to thank the organizers of the conference for having me. Who says there's no cricket in America? I have found that there is a very active cricketing world in America, um, especially in New York, which is truly the, the capital of cricket um, in North America. Um, it is a transnational fraternity, which I think was touched upon um, by Dr. Cliff um, and Dr. Carrington about this movement of professional and semi-professional players um, between regions to play in summer leagues. And that certainly is true of um, the league I spent time in last summer, uh, the Metropolitan Cricket League, where there are many former and current test match players, um, Barrington Barkley and, and Kruma Bonner, among others, who will um, come up and play for the summer. This uh, project was filmed, was produced by National Black Programming Consortium. Um, it's in the last legs of production and I'm really pleased to share it with you all. And I think that you will um, certainly see many of the things touched upon um, in the previous presentations. Um, it is for an, an American audience. That was a concern of the producers. So there are subtitles and there is a breakdown of um, how to play cricket. So Minka, that's for you. <laughs> so let's see. From me, every Sunday, we left the wife, so my time we left the kids, so people could go to work. All of that come down, the Sunday coming. All of that sacrifice come down, the Sunday coming. Cricket is my life. I love cricket. Wherever I go, I go with cricket. Wherever cricket go, I go there too. People pray for Sunday to come. People can't wait for the Sunday to come. I want, I want to go where there is no heartache, sorrow, pain, shame, or disgrace. No more can I face that. After when that day comes. So that's why I'm trying today, getting older, to walk by faith and not by sight.
Always is and was an English game. They brought it to the Caribbean. Was a way of flexing our muscle around. Coming from a small nation, this was the only thing we was recognized in the world by our cricket. You got three pillars. You have to protect the stump at all times. And when you're batting, anytime the ball hits the stump, you're out. Get you by you popping up a catch like a fly ball in the outfield in the baseball. That's another out. Got to run between the, the wickets to get one run. When, when both batsmen change ends, it's one run. If he gets down and back, that's two runs. And if the ball runs close to the boundary here, you can always run one or two. But once he touches the rope, that's it, you get four for him because he hit the boundary line. And if he goes over it, you get six. They have six tries to get you out, and then that's an over. In the one day format, which is the 40 overs, the batter will stay out there and, until he gets out. If, if he's still there and the 40 overs is finished, then, then he have to come in, you know, and then the other team goes out. They try to get over, over all the total that the first team got, so whoever scored the most runs win. The honest to you, cricket is young people's game. A lot of members on the bench right now, because we all know we can't play cricket no more. You don't walk up the street and it's coming in the cricket. You got to be physical fit and you got to sign. Because if you should get injured, there's an insurance is there for you. It's not that, 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 that. Just walk off and have a little fun. It's a real thing. The batting order. Uh, we have Dervin Moran, our leading run getter. Kadim a young player that came in from Jamaica. Then you have Tuan Henry. We have Lord Ratchery. We have Malcolm Gray. Courtney Ellett, he's our assistant coach. Morris Cole, uh, he's our coach. We have Mr. Miller. Present captain Kevin George. And Mike Alexis, we call him the hitman. Naki, very good youngster. Our main run getter, national player, uh, John Sylvester. Never ever miss a game out of my club. This is our church, our fun. It was playing beautiful cricket. We thought the game was was won and over. And we start the batsmen start doing something foolish for some reason or other. Between the last one wicket, two wicket, three wicket. When I reach at the wicket, we needed 12 runs from 12 ball. 12 runs from 12 ball, it's a matter of keeping yourself calm and collected at the wicket at the time. Uh, the first two balls we accumulated three runs from it and needed four balls to get six runs. Uh, Maris Cole hit the ball out of the park, six runs was, was get for the, uh, for the win. That was basically it. Gucci, I love you. Gucci. I'm <laughs> <laughs>
plan for Batlam. Right, the top six need for put you in a position. Seem to get you close to 200 or over 200 if it's possible. You know the man them doing a button half can, 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 can put up 130 or 40 or Right? So the top six you have to knock it down and back. The simple as that. Knock it down and back. Gentlemen, I not much to say. That is the ballroom now, right? The bright light is out now, the spectator is in the audience. Enjoy. That's from day one, that is where we wanted to start, and that's where we are now. Please, let's just enjoy. Volume dancing, light is on, gentlemen. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Vying for championship supremacy. Uh, Westbury versus Progressive. There's no other club in the in the league's history that has become that has uh, won more championship games than Westbury. But standing in the way, Progressive and their manager Jeff James uh, has the champagne on ice. Whether or not he will get to uh, uncork that champagne is left to be seen. Win, 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 win. We the only thing that count. L lose don't count. Win is, is everything in game. Do you believe that? How could we be proud of a winning, a losing team? Show me where, when, and how it could go like that. Wait, which one do you believe? You, you, don't you believe in that? Here's the first goal, Mike Yannatus to Dennison Thomas. Very windy condition here at Floyd Bennett Field, and certainly Mike Yannatus with the wind behind his back. As the ball goes up towards the offside, off the edge, onto the pad by Dennison Thomas, so he gets a single. John Sylvester. So Sylvester will continue to Barkley, and Barkley is uh, driving straight back and uh, striking Javin Thomas in the process. So, uh, so Maurice Powell continues to Barkley, and Barkley is uh, pushing back straight to uh, Maurice Powell. He gets hands to it. He doesn't accept the catch. Things are falling apart here, so to speak, uh, by, by, by Progressive. As Westbury's innings comes to a close at 237, and we'll take a break and resume once cricket best. Progressive needing 238 if they are to emerge victorious. And they'll have to deal with this man, uh, former West Indies senior. Uh, Jeremy Lawson was at one time one of the fastest bowler in the Caribbean. And uh, Lawson, a very fiery fast bowler. John Sylvester provided considerable strength. Top quality batsman. Need to put in one of those 
extraordinary performance here today. Very important over here. the strike They're picking up Moran uh, and Sylvester is essentially the top order of the progressive batting has been ripped away Get to that shot, Lamp. No, I don't know what's in there. That's a bad one. I don't suppose that shot, that shot just sick. And that's going to win the win. That's a bad one. 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 That's a well, you know, but like you last year. I'm not quite with you. I'm not quite you. not you. i all right. What is someone I know? Somebody by the phone. Somebody by the phone. John Moran goes and progressive. Moran rather goes. In the Belgian. So the home it uh, could be it, and in fact that does it. Uh, Westbury are the champs of the 2012 Metropolitan Cricket League. The catch taken in the B backward square air, uh, and uh, Westbury emerges victorious. In fact, uh, they win by 105 runs. So uh, Westbury are the champs uh, in uh, this the 2012 Metropolitan Cricket League season. Last week, Westbury won a game. The week before, they lost a game. And I said to someone, great teams never lose twice. Very seldom lose twice. And Westbury has showed us that you are the greatest team. When a team cannot embrace defeat, you should not accept a win. Because when you win, it's a certain stigma sent to your brain and your body. You jump for joy. Now, when you lose, you crumble like leaves. No. When you learn to accept defeat, gentlemen, in such manner that when you win, you win and accept the win. But it's a part of you, you know, like your your cricket, your lift up my life. I love cricket. Wherever I go, I go with cricket. Wherever cricket go, I go there too. somebody left something profound to ask but I wanted to ask Ben about the dentist mm -hmm. is it what I assume <laughs> it might be yeah I didn't get to the punchline did I um, yeah uh, he was 
very early on in his career. Um, he was bowling against at the time. The guy was the captain of the Leeward Islands. So he was coming up, and this was one of the top batsmen. Short pitch ball, hit him in the face, teeth on the floor. And so very quickly, as, as you know, in the Caribbean, his, his nickname became the dentist. And I actually only found out what his real name was uh, when I went back to the field, because some of the guys have nicknames, and that just becomes the, the, the name in which they're referred to. It actually took a bit, a bit of work to actually realise that he was, he was John Maynard. And then when I did some research, when, when England toured in 94, Three ninety four. They played like, warm up games, obviously, and um, now he did really well against Atherton and, and and those guys. I mean, he was taking w wickets left, right, and centre. And, and like I say, like Robin Smith, even today says, "I oh, know." But the, the dent. So one of the things that's maybe just one of the things that's interesting around the dentist, and it kind of comes back to the, maybe the more analytical point I was trying to refer to. So he has this fearsome reputation of the dentist. Um, when we played in that uh, T20 soccer game, where a lot of the other guys came from other Caribbean clubs around Britain. Um, we was actually sitting at the bar uh, one, 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 during, during, the, during the game, and the dentist's name came up, and I was actually sitting next to the dentist, and there was another guy. And for some reason, he thought the dentist had dreadlocks. So and he thought I was the dentist. And, this come, and he, said, he said, are you the dentist? <laughs> and I went, no, like, this is the dentist. Like, this is... And he kind of looked at John and said, no, no, no he's not the dentist. But no, this is John, this is like, this is the dentist. And part of it was that he had such a fearsome reputation. But one of the questions is, well... Especially for bowlers, maybe as opposed to batsmen. What happens when you turn 40, 41, 42, like John now is, and, you, and your trade is as a fast bowler, and you can't push it through at you know, 85, 87, 88, days of you maybe hitting 90 miles an hour or, or, or long gone, but you're still relying upon white clubs in Yorkshire to come and, and, you know, and pay you through. And so something actually about the body, the, way, the, the Asian bodies of these guys that can't function the way in which they want them to, and their identities are so tied to that. And it's actually, I think, an interesting question around John still being the dentist, this fearsome figure who terrorised English batsmen you know, for, for, for so long, who's kind of recognised in many circles as one of the fastest bowlers you know, to, to play in the Caribbean at a certain level. And, when, and he's backs out. So actually, right now, he, he's not playing. Like this, this season, I spoke to him at the, at the weekend. Um, because he's got, you know, he's got a back injury, he hasn't got insurance. No, he's not playing for a professional club that's going to pay lots of money for him to have physio. Clubs only want him. And this kind of comes back to an interesting dynamic, I think, about clubs. So we, we've, when we looked at the, the Nelson example, when you know, Constantine always goes to Nelson, there, there's lots of very similar stories around league cricket of guys from the Caribbean that come and play. And, and I'm, I have, on the one hand, it, there's a kind of nice interaction there. Yeah, now you have... Like, white working class spaces into which these black guys come and they're welcome, they become friends and then and genuine forms of, of, of sociality and friendship are established beyond the racial boundaries. But it's predicated on them taking lots of wickets each season off their batter scoring lots of runs. And if they don't, they're not going to pay for them to come back and put them up in a house, etc. if they're not performing. And so I still haven't worked out in my mind about the extent to which this is simply black sporting labour that gets hired in for summer so we can be our, our rivals next door. And the extent to which genuine friendships and relationships were established, which changed people's perceptions around forms of racial difference and racial tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't quite worked out in, in, in my mind uh, that, I, you know, how, how that functions. But I think there is something about you know, the, the damage that's done to these black sporting bodies for whom, once they're no longer productive, the contracts aren't renewed. It's a very kind of you know, brutal, brutal kind of you know, regime as we know. But yeah, he, he doesn't have a dental practice. He, he knocks people's teeth out. <laughs> yes, I am Walter Persaud. Uh, I have a question about, Ben's your use of the concept of the post-colonial. Mm -hmm. You see, I started working with this concept in about 1987. And um, partly because of difficulties with the concept, I had to just give up a lot of stuff. And I've been in Thailand since then. So when someone uses the concept, I'm paying close attention. Let me just go through a couple of things. You see, in Bangkok, where I play cricket and where I live and teach, there are 25 clubs in the league, and all except two of them are, on, are, are Asian. They are Pakistani and Indians. The other two clubs are made up of uh, New Zealand, uh, Kiwis, Aussies, and Brits. South African, I think there might be one or two. And uh, one of the problems that these two clubs, Siam CC and Southerners Cricket Club, have with Asian players is that Asian guys 
only come to play cricket. They don't drink. So that's a problem. For me, I, I, I hear that same statement. I think when you refer to the way in which CCC talks about the Asian players. So I'm wondering in, in that sense then, are we not dealing here with an anti-colonial politics rather than a post-colonial politics? I mean, Ashish Nandi calls in, uh, cricket an Indian game accidentally uh, discovered by the British. <laughs> On the ACC website, Asian Cricket Council's website, the slogan is, it's Asian. Uh, it's cricket, it's Asian. So again, the idea of playing cricket to win seems to be, well, one of the complaints by the uh, Southerners and Siam Cricket Club, again, the Asian guys play to win. Now, they, that, that seems to be something similar to West Indian cricket, Caribbean cricket, if I follow the second presentation. So I'm wondering whether you, know, you have thought, in what way is this post-colonial as opposed to anti-colonial? Things I, you might have seen that when I do use the term post-colonial, I, I use a Virgil, I use that, the, the, the slash, which is deliberate. Um, and as I kind of said at, at the beginning, it's my attempt to think about this particular moment in which formal forms of colonial governance, governance no longer exist, at least not in the same ways in which they did. But neo-colonial re relations are, are, are played out. I think it's precisely trying to think about, and this maybe you know, links into what I said earlier about reading beyond the boundaries of kind of decolonizing spurt, that there are certain anti-colonial sensibilities that, that are articulated, but it's in a different context. And I actually do think understanding the different context as to, how we f to what is found in 2013 is, is a different political and cultural space to, say, 1963 or or the, the late 1950s. So I'm, I'm problematic as is, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy to wrestle with the problematics of what the post-colonial kind of throws up. And I do think there is, and I mean, just to be clear, um, some older members of the Caribbean Cricket Club think that some of these young Asian guys aren't supporting the club. It wouldn't, it'd be a mystery to say the Caribbean Cricket Club universally all has this position because of our, and that's one of the things I tried to kind of allude to, there are competing discourses that happen within any club. I mean, there's no fractions, etc., etc. One of the things that I have found that's interesting is a kind of you know, black and brown unite and fight discourse, in as much as is referred to earlier, especially after the, the bombings in 2005, the ways in which these young Asian guys and their everyday experiences, especially with the, the, the West Yorkshire police force, mirror very similar, they have very similar experiences to what young black British guys have. And actually, there is this kind of uh, con convergence, which actually does take place literally on the grounds of, of, of the cricket ground. And that's one of the spikes. Because there are, there are, on the one hand, there are still remaining tensions between South Asian populations and Black Caribbean populations, Black British populations in and around Leeds. But this, the, the cricket club is this kind of, I would call it a kind of a post-colonial space in which those former colonial subjects from out there find themselves back at the metropole and actually do have a shared sense of sensibility, politics, and understanding. So when they play... They, the, many of the young Asian guys actually are, are quite proud to be playing for the Caribbean Cricket Club because they see the ways in which they're, they, they are treated by the police and, and white authority figures as being very similar to what the young black British guys have, have faced. And that gets taken onto the, onto the pitch as well. So there is no need for a translation in the same way in which, for, the, for sure, when he says, no, when we talk about the white man, this is what we mean, the young Asian lads get that. There's no, and they don't have to say, like, when we talk about white, no, that, that they will use that language themselves, in fact. So I think there's something that's interesting going on there. Whether or not I would frame it as anti-colonial, possibly in some senses, but I'm, I'm not sure of the analytical kind of purchase that that would give me. Thanks, um, Andy Smith uh, here at Glasgow. Um, uh, just a, a comment, really, to follow up on something you just said there, Ben, in answer to one of the questions. Um, that question about the 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 body of the professional cricketer, which of course James does write about, especially in that that essay on Barnes, uh, where, he, where he he describes Barnes at this point an aging professional, um, and he uses a very interesting sort of industrial metaphor for Barnes cranking the old machinery into action again, which seems to me quite deliberately chosen on on James's part, but in that 
period of his life. It's recognising that in a very particular kind of sense, the professional cricketer is a kind of a, a, a labouring body that is being used up in their in work that they do. Um, but my question was really to Lionel. Um, I, I thought the whole panel was really terrific, very interesting. But one of the things that um, strikes you about English cricketing culture, and it came across a little bit in Ben's talk also, on the one hand, there's always been that tradition of arrogance in English cricketing culture, and it comes across so strongly in the imperial history of the game, of course, and it's used as an assertion of superiority in all kinds of ways. On the other hand, and at the same time, though, there's always this, there's this profound nostalgic a sense of vulnerability and embattledness and so much of the kind of classic literature of English cricket is rife with this sense that the cricket field is under threat either from the kind of wider forces of modernity or f from some other set of encroaching uh, forces which are which are threatening it English cricket particularly uh, and I wondered to what extent th that kind of uh, sense of being under siege and the cricket pitch particularly as a loaded symbolic space of Englishness, English identity under siege somehow is what is, is, is it, it has played out historically in, in the history of Yorkshire cricket particularly at least up until the, the sort of the, the change that you described later on in the talk. It's interesting you mentioned SF Barnes and, and the very first essay the article that uh, C.L.R. James wrote was this contest between S.F. Barnes and Leary Constantine. And an observation, I mean, in a way, the point about winning in cricket is quite more complicated because actually what happens in cricket is enormous respect from the teams for each other. And I remember, it's not a directly C.L.R. James memory, but it's a John Arlott memory. And I went to meet John Arlott and I met him. He was in the press box at Lord's on a miserable day when Nottingham were playing Middlesex, and there was hardly anybody in the ground, there were almost no spectators at all. And I said to John, and he was surrounded by all these other cricket writers who are all going to send in a, a description of this match to be read in daily papers all around England. I said, do you never feel very peculiar? You're sitting here describing a match that nobody's actually watching but you lot. You're all turning it into an article in tomorrow's paper. And he said, you know, the thing about cricket is that there's always the other team who is watching. That when you're playing cricket, if you're a batsman, you have the fielders who are watching you and your fellow players. And the very few sports where a century is applauded by the team against whom that century has been scored. So there is this enormous respect. And I think one of the things that really you get in a lot of C.L.R. James's writing and reporting, and you get it in that first article he wrote which got him his job with Neville Cardus. You get it in the one that's reproduced here when he's describing the contest between Hedley Verity and Don Bradman. Is this incredible attention to the respect of cricketers for each other. And so winning, and it is interesting that you often can have a match in which the most memorable performance happens from the member of the team that's lost. And what you come away is remembering a remarkable feat. But it's actually by the team that's lost. So winning doesn't define the meaning of cricket in quite the way that which, uh, it does often in other sports. Uh, and the only other, and I think the other thing about violence, because what is interesting also about cricket, I think, is that tension between violence and decorum. That's what's so interesting about it. You know, in other much more physical sports, in football, soccer, rugby, you know, the violence and the, 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 the encounter is much more direct. In cricket, it's by means of a ball. You know, there's a distance, and you propel that ball at the batsman. And that gives, and yet the thing has got this incredibly complicated and s structure. And that's interesting because violence erupts in a more complicated way, in a more subtle way, and expressed in a more subtle way in cricket. And, and the only other thing, which is a separate memory, which is triggered by this, is, uh, and it's triggered by cricket in America, because one of the sort of very peculiar experiences I had with C.L.R. James um, was in New York, when uh, he was invited to the Black Athletes Hall of Fame uh, which is being held at the Hilton Hotel in Fifth Avenue. And 
it's obviously an American occasion. It was hosted by, um, what's his name, uh, Bill Cosby. And it was basically about honoring American athletes. But they'd done this gesture of inviting a group of Caribbean West Indian cricketers to receive the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, one of whom was Gary Sobers. And I remember meeting Gary Sobers for the very first time with CLR James in a hotel bedroom and thing. And that was kind of interesting and complicated because CLR James had written that terrific essay about Gary Sobers. But you could see Gary Sobers almost feeling uncomfortable about carrying the weight of meaning for himself that CLR James read into his presence. Because Gary Sobers wasn't an intellectual figure. He was uh, a spontaneously gifted, astonishingly gifted athlete who did embody everything that CLR James wanted a Caribbean and a West Indian athlete to, to embody. But he wasn't embodying it in a self-conscious way. And he found that the, the, what I did sort of experience this tension between how Gary Sobers saw himself and how CLR James saw himself. And in that social encounter, there was a sort of unease and, 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 and complicated. But the most painful memory of all was in the Bill Cosby address when all the conventional prejudices of Americans against cricket all get played out as humor. So at the simultaneously, as these West Indian athletes were inducted into the Hall of Fame, they were being patronized as playing a completely ridiculous game called cricket, which of course didn't measure up at all to the complexity and interesting thing of baseball and American football. And that was something. Because yeah. what was really one, sorry, sorry, I'll shut up, but the, the interesting thing, well, I suppose it's just memories of C.L.R. James, because actually what's fantastic about his writing is he really paid attention to baseball. He learned baseball. He had responded to baseball. But I feel he made that response towards baseball, but I don't think Americans have ever made that response towards cricket. Yeah. I just wanted to respond, because I know, I mean, there's that famous uh, Cosby episode where he invites his West Indian friend over for a cricket match. He's like, what is this sport? You know, you have tea in the middle of the game. But um, actually in New York, there's a real push to uh, kind of integrate cricket into American sports culture. It's actually um, played now in New York public schools. Um, they've just built a stadium in Fort Lauderdale. And there's, yes, you're nodding, yes. There's a, I think it's really viewed by a number of cricket administrators as a, a ripe market. Um, so. You'd be surprised. I think there are, um, you know, there is an, there's also a, n a new U.S. national team. I think there is an active kind of seed to make cricket something that Americans, not just of West Indian or South Asian or British, et cetera, um, heritage to participate in. And um, actually, just to maybe say, because those were scenes from one part of Brooklyn, very Caribbean, um, and other parts that are now highly gentrified, you do even have uh, Caribbean and South Asian, just regular folk coming to play in the parks, and other people are just watching the game, sitting on the side. So it is gaining a bit of popularity. Yeah. Um, just a little defense of America, a little bit. <laughs> Very interested in your, your take on the progress of, of Pakistanis and Yorkshire cricket, which has obviously been rather wonderful. But how do you tally that with the you know, the perception of the way Adil Rashid's been treated in recent times, the complaints he made, he went out of his way to say to the media, and I suppose the journalists concerned, they try to set it up as he took it out of context or whatever, but nonsense. Obviously very unhappy. Makes 180 yes two days ago. You'd think you'd put him on the bowl early the following day, he has to wait till the 63rd over. Is there something going on here? Do they think he's too big for his boots? Do you know that? I don't know. Yeah. Um, part of the arduous research that's gone into this is the fact that I had to sit in the <laughs> lead sunshine watching those 180 runs that <laughs> Adil Rashid scored on Tuesday. It's a very tough life being a researcher. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, your question is very important and if I had had more time or, or balanced my time better I would have finished on not so much the wonderful <laughs> note, and I, which I think is worth registering, but on the, the question which the, the written form of the paper uh, took, and that is that, in Marcuse's terms, 
there hasn't yet been the transition to a definite, to a different definition of Englishness in cricket yet. And I think the sign of this, from a Yorkshire perspective, is the fact not only that Rashid was regarded as on the edge of the England team two years ago, and then has had two lousy seasons, and it could well be that it's two lousy summers where leg spinners are never going to prosper. But he's had this confrontation with the management over how he manages his career and how, and how he plays. That would be worrying enough, but the year before, the same thing happened with uh, uh, Shahzad, another Pakistani Yorkshire product who had played a test match and who questions the role he's being asked to play, probably pushed into a more defensive role than he wants. And on, again, on cricketing grounds, gets into a dispute. He's told he's not welcome at Yorkshire, plays as a visitor for Lancashire and has now been signed by, by Nottingham. Now, if amongst this small group of Asian players that have made it through the Yorkshire system, there are two, and if you like, probably Rafiq, who've run into problems of management. I think at least some attention has got to be given to whether or not what are now, I think, fairly laudable intentions at the level of the county and especially the cricket board are actually being realized by the coaching practices at that top level. At the lower levels, coaches are being coached in methods that include cultural sensitivity, if you like, but whether or not it happens at the higher levels is a big issue. And I think uh, what I would say, and this partly answers Andy's question wherever he is, is that uh, I haven't tried to answer the question about how does the defensive view of the English sort of react to the situation that I was describing, um, partly because I'd just been concerned with, with the other side of the question of, of what is happening to and what more will it take for Englishness to be extended unequivocally to uh, Asian and Caribbean players, because it isn't yet unequivocal. And the adjustment has got to come almost entirely on the, on the side of English uh, coaches, spectators, and, and, and so on. And, and it's such a profound issue in British society and politics. And it's, it is more than post-colonial, and not just other than post-colonial, that it, it, it does need very serious attention. So your question, I think, you know, does take the discussion forward rather than just backward, and is is a well, very welcome. All right. So I think that's point. And I, uh, the one word I was going to add is that I think Andy's question, I thought, from what do the English make of the feeling that they're being uh, oppressed, victimized? I, I would say, jokingly, to Andy, that's that's a UKIP view of English cricket. I think. Uh. All right, so why don't we thank our panelists.